Good morning, Covenant Church Online. We are so excited that you have joined us from wherever you're watching from, if that's on YouTube, Facebook, or even our podcast version. We used to start the day called Strategic Advantage. But before we get into that, we have a couple of announcements for you. First up, on June 27th, we have the Love's Journey Family Day, and that is gonna be at the South Mountain State Park. They will be leaving after Sunday Connect that Sunday morning for a great day full of fun, fellowship, and food. So make sure that you sign up on our church app or on the website so they can get the food prepared. Next, parents. If you haven't already signed your kiddos up for Vacation Bible School, be sure to do that either on the app or on the church website. Or if you already have them signed up, use this as an outreach opportunity. Think of cousins or neighbors or your kids' friends or teammates who would love to come out with them and get them signed up too. If you decide to just bring them the day of, no big deal. We can get them signed up at the door, no problem. We are so excited because Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow. You're not gonna want your kiddos to miss out on crafts, games, Bible, water nights, and we even feed them dinner. Be sure you have them signed up either on the church app or at covenantchurch.church. We can't wait to see you guys there. Lastly, we have a couple of exciting changes. You know how we always used to text a certain phrase to 94090? Well, now that number is gone and we have now connected our text message to our phone here at the church. So we have one thing we need you to do right now. So I'm gonna wait so you can take out your phones. You can take out your phones. So you're taking out your phones right now. And you are going to text COVENANT to 704-735-1559. I'll say it one more time because I assume you already took out your phone. So take out your phone and text COVENANT to 704-735-1559. With that, what we're gonna be able to do is keep you up to date on all of the events and any notifications that we have to get you on a weekly basis.
Hey, Covenant Church family, I just uh, wanted to touch base with you uh, today and uh, just kind of have a family conversation. And I know, um, I'm well aware that there'll be people that are outside of Covenant that are listening to this, but I just feel like it's it's a good opportunity for us to have like a, what I'm calling like a midterm uh, kind of conversation. Uh, we're in June of 2021 and we're, we're right in the middle of the year. And uh, I like to every, every month or, or so at least, go back and look at the vision that I, I have for the year and just kind of touch base with my own heart and kind of reflect on whether I'm following that thing. Like I feel like God sh showed me how to do it. The way I, I come up with the vision basically is that every every year, starting in by August or September of last year, I just start asking God, you know, just some for some specifics about what we're supposed to look like next year. What What kind of thing are you gonna speak to our church? The Bible says in Proverbs, for lack of vision, people perish, and I and I believe that's true with the church. I think if we if we don't have a vision, we don't have a plan, vision from God, like a, a directive, even uh, I, I think we can lose our way. And last year was a very interesting year in general uh, with all of the COVID stuff. We had a season where we weren't in the same building, and and just the anxiety or the uncertainty that was brought about uh, on the on the whole body of Christ. And not just covenant, but I mean the body of Christ in general. I saw just a lot of anxiety and wonder and concern, and and we all saw our our way of living change so drastically, so very quickly, and how that affected the church. And and uh, so anyway, I believe that led to part of the vision that we ended up getting. So, some of of what I'm going to even talk to you about today. Uh, will actually reach all the way back into to some into last year, October, November, uh, about what I think God began to define for us as as, as a direction uh, moving forward uh, to a church that was to some degree uh, anxious, but to, to some degree, in my personal opinion, a, a little anemic uh, and, and maybe even apathetic uh, uh, anyway for, for a season. Uh, before I do that, I wanted, to, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what's on my heart this morning uh, as far as our body, specifically Covenant Church. And if you're listening to this and you go to another church, now I want to encourage you uh, to listen to the, the content of what I'm about to share. Uh, but I'm not in trying to get you to switch churches. I'm just, I'm just encouraging you and what I believe the Lord was speaking to me uh, uh, this past weekend. The last two weeks, uh, I was I was gone. I took two Sundays off uh, in a row, which I never do. Uh, I've done that a couple times in my 15 years of ministering here, but I rarely take two Sundays in a row off. The reason for that is because uh, I just like continuity. I'm I'm one of those people that just thrives on you know continuity and order and going to the next thing and building the next block. Um, but I didn't take uh, really any time off last year probably since last May or June, you know, I, didn't, I used to, I usually, every year, I usually try to take a Sunday off uh, about once a quarter, and that's not because I feel like uh, that the church is trying to kill me and I'm working myself to death or that I'm you know, that valuable uh, that I need some time off. Uh, honestly, the reason I do it is because I feel like uh, about once every few months, uh, I, I usually preach three, four, or five times a week, uh, counting all these videos and and Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings and different things, uh, not to mention weddings and funerals and all those things like that. Uh, but anyway, last year I didn't take any time off because I felt like if I were going to have church and we were in the middle of, of the pandemic, uh, that I needed to be the guy here, uh, that I wanted to be on the front lines. I wasn't going to ask anybody else to jump out there on the front lines if I weren't willing to be there myself. And so... Uh, as we prayed about that from week to week to week to week and month to month to month to month about whether we were supposed to be together, when when I would hear in my heart the Lord say, yeah, be together, then I felt like I needed to be here. So anyway, long story short, that's why I took two weeks in a row off. The first week we actually were out of the country, uh, but last Sunday I was actually back in town, and um, it's weird being in town for me and not being in church, uh, but Sunday morning the family and and myself, we went to just took a morning, went to Cracker Barrel Sunday morning as a family, and uh, just kind of hung out. Had to run to Target. I know y'all really wanted to know that, but uh, uh, but while I was out and about 
10 or 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. It, what, what really, really shocked me was the number of other people who were out. Now, obviously there probably could be a, a percentage of those people who like myself are regular attendees of church somewhere. Maybe they were on vacation, you know, uh, maybe some of those people were going to and from work. I, I don't know, but, but it just seemed like to me more people uh, than normal were just out and about and something just hit my heart in, in a way that it kind of just, I don't know, discouraged me, I guess, uh, of how many people just were kind of nonchalantly going about life on a Sunday morning. Now, some of those people may have gone to church somewhere on a Saturday night and maybe some of them went to an eight o'clock service somewhere. But even with all of that said, there's probably, in, in my guesstimation, no way that all of those people were Saturday night attenders, Sunday early morning attenders, or on vacation. In other words, there's a lot of people just out and about not going to church, and and that concerns me. But also, I'm a practical person, too. I, I know there are a lot of people that don't go to church, and that hurts my heart. Uh, because I was a preacher's kid, I spent inordinate amount of time in church. Church became not just a habit to our family, but was very important to our family. And I believe according to God's word, 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the value of the body and how important it is for each member of the body to have its place in the church. Uh, I, I think every joint supplies. I, th I think uh, it doesn't matter if you're the person standing on the stage preaching or leading worship or if you're a person that sits on the back row, I think you, you have uh, equal value and importance to to the body of Christ. We, we need one another. In fact, Hebrews 10 encourages us to not forsake meeting together. And, and the Bible even says, as some people get in the habit of doing. In other words, you can get in the habit of something uh, like going to church, but you can also get in the habit of not going to church. Now, I don't want you here uh, in church, at this church or at your, your, your home church, out of habit. I, I want you engaged and, and I want you to know that you have value and importance uh, wherever you go to church because God's put something in you. He didn't put in anybody else in the earth. I also know this year because of the pandemic there were there was a real lengthy season where everybody didn't feel comfortable being in church buildings with a lot of people and I get that uh, but I honestly feel in my heart that uh, most of, of that those anxious moments of the pandemic are behind us. And and I'm very, very concerned in my heart, not because I'm mad at anybody, but because I care so deeply for everybody that there are a lot of people who got out of the habit or out of the, the swing of being in church and are now in the habit of not being at church. Uh, it, it, it shocked me how many people uh, I saw Sunday morning with boats on the, you know, connected to the back of their vehicles and different things like that that I know uh, it's it's easy when you get out of the routine of being in the body of Christ and coming to church I, I know it's easy because I, I know a lot of people who really enjoy having like two Saturdays uh, but I'm really encouraging you to really really get back in the body get back in the church get get back to our church if that's you get back to your personal church if there's another church you go to our, our church needs our people and your church needs you and so i want to encourage you to get back in the habit of being in the body of christ because what you ha what you have to offer the body of christ is different from anybody else on the earth uh, uh you you have you have a uniqueness to you by god's design that makes you different from everybody else on the earth and we need the thing that god is doing in you uh to to use what what god's going to use you for to do in me and so uh please please get back in here uh back back to today's kind of conversation i i really want to talk to you a little bit about uh, of the, our vision for the year which was called our 2020 21 vision was called you can't sit this one out uh, and it was birthed in my in my prayer closet, uh, thinking about all those things that I just got through mentioning. People were 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 worried. People were uh, anxious. People were uh, scared, and and so thinking through all of that, I, I feel like God was really kind of recalibrating the church. I think even though God didn't bring the 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 
COVID-19. I, I do believe he's, he's going to use it and has been using it uh, for an anxious, unfocused church. And I think what God is doing specifically in this season is that he's, re, he's recalibrating the church. He is, he is he's, he's causing us to think through uh, the things that we, we, we maybe got right and maybe some of the things we didn't get right. And so anyway, so I got, I got four bullet points I want to talk to you about quickly uh, today about what I think God was recalibrating, what was he doing, what was he teaching me about, what was he teaching us about. Uh, when, I, when, I, when I was praying about the vision for the year, uh, the, the, the things, and we're not through with the vision, obviously, for the year. I'm getting ready to do a series out of Daniel where I, I believe God has given me more revelation uh, about uh, what the enemy's trying to do in this season. Uh, than I've ever had before in my whole life. I, I've, I've, I've probably got a deeper connection to my father than I've ever had in my life. I feel like I'm, and, and I don't view myself as somebody that, that you know, hears the, 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 the actual voice, out loud voice of God every single day of my life. But I feel like right now that I'm, I'm hearing the spiritual voice of God like I've never heard it before in my whole life. And so uh, that's what went into these four things. Uh, two of them are are things that I felt like we were getting wrong, uh, and and two of them are challenges that I believe God wants to bring us to to toward as we're starting to get it right. And so, uh, the the verse for the year I, I, is is out of Daniel nine. It's just verses two and three, and, and and I'll explain what it means after I read it. It says this: In the first year of his reign, uh, I, Daniel, understood by the books the numbers, the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. And then I set my face toward God. What's he talking about here is basically uh, Daniel uh, along with Israel had been taken captive by the Babylonians. And Daniel was reading the word of God, reading from the prophet Jeremiah. And he recognized that God had prophesied in Jeremiah that Israel would be held captive for a 70 year window. And he cal calculated that out to be the present time they were getting ready to approach. And he said, when I read in Jeremiah that the 70 years time season was up, uh, I set my face toward God. In other words, uh, he didn't just go sit down and say, I'm gonna wait for God to deliver us. I didn't, I, he didn't go to sleep and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to sleep until God wake me up when you get here. No, he set his face toward God and, and went about the business of, of, of trying to hear the voice of God in a season where God had promised a move of God. And for them, it was, it was for their deliverance. Uh, for us, I don't, know, I don't know what all it's gonna entail. Uh, I, I do believe I've heard in my spirit that there's a, a move of God on the horizon. In fact, I believe we're in the middle of that now. Uh, I, I believe God is doing something very, very special. I think the that God is everywhere always, all the time. But I also believe that there's this part of God where he, he, he rests in seasons and in times more heavily or with, 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 a, with a broader stroke than at other times. And I believe we're in the middle of one of those moments where God is doing something very, very special and pouring out his spirit like I've not seen it before in, in my years of ministry. And so... Daniel recognized the potential for for an outpouring. He, he recognized the potential for a, a move of God. He felt like it was the right time, and so he set his face toward God. Now you have two choices as you look back over the last year and the anxiety of of the year and the pandemic and COVID nineteen and being away from church and all that other stuff. Uh, you you can either get really really scared and 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 just dive into a hole, or you can you can run like crazy to your father's heart. And I believe that's what many in the body of Christ are doing uh, in this season. So what what are the two things I believe God was really trying to correct in the church over the past year? And and, and, and I'm gonna name at least two things that we feel like he's actually been doing in us as he's corrected those first two things. So the first thing I think we were doing wrong, the first, the first corrective thing to calibrate the church in a right direction is that he called us out, I believe. Number one, uh, have we been trusting in wrong provisions? In, in other words, uh, if you're not careful in America, and this doesn't happen in China and in the other ground church in Iran and other places, 
But in America, because uh, we, we live in the greatest country on earth and we have religious freedoms like no other, church, no other country in the world, it can get really, really easy to take those things for granted. Not only do we have a, a freedom to, to assemble, but we also have a whole lot of other resources. In other words, if we get sick, we go to the doctor. If we, if we need money, we go borrow money. If, you know, we have most, most of us, not all of us, but most of us are surrounded by people if not family, people, that if we're hungry, we can get a meal. Uh, so there, there, there stands a chance in all of that for us to not always trust in God for our provision. Uh, and, and I think that's what God has said to us. We, we've trusted in, in elections. We've, we've hoped in, in new jobs. We've hoped in other people taking care of us. We, we've hoped in a lot of things. And what I believe the first calibration, the first correction that God wanted to bring to the church is, is he wanted us to, to completely, solely trust wholly in, in him to be our provider. He, he is our Jehovah Jireh, our provider. But if we're not careful, we'll, we'll choose other things and allow other things to be our God, to allow other things to be the, the thing that provides for us. And so our first, I, I felt like the first thing he called me out on personally was, he said, "Mike, you, you, in, in, in the in the middle of this this moment where you're, you're you're you don't know what's next when we were separated." He said, "You know, one of the things I'm trying to call you to do, call you back into, is is a complete trust in me. I, I want you to quit trusting in other things to be a provider for you, and I want you to trust in me." And the scripture that came to my mind was Psalm 27. It says, "This some will trust in chariots and horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord." And, and one of the very the sentences I'll, I'll never forget uh, last year when we were, uh, we, were, we were not meeting together as a church, I was in my prayer closet and I heard the Lord say to me one morning, I cho I've chosen you, but you've chosen another. And, and that broke my heart that God would speak that to me. And I, I think it may be true of the body of Christ in general for some of us, that while we've been chosen by God, there are times that we, chose, we choose other things to be uh, to hope in and God wants us to only hope in him so so the number one thing I believe God wants to, to to do for us to correct us is that we would learn to hope only in him the number two thing uh, that I, I believe that he wants us to do is is, is learn to bring correct right worship uh, last year I'll, I'll never forget uh, when the pandemic started the, the book I was drawn to was the book of Malachi and in the book of Malachi uh, one of the things that God called Malachi, uh, called Israel out on through Malachi was they, they were bringing uh, uh, polluted food and blind animals to sacrifice. In other words, they, their whole heart wasn't in it. Their complete devotion to, to, to bringing right worship, uh, wasn't their, 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 they just, their hearts weren't connected to the thing that God had called them to. And when, when God spoke to my heart that we were bringing the church in America oftentimes brings polluted food and blind animals. It, it, it kind of put me in the mind of and reminded me that, that sometimes we don't give God our best worship. We have so many things. Our, our, our loyalties are divided so often in America. Uh, and, and, and this is for church people and, and, and not non-church people alike. We, we just hope in a lot of different things. We, we 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 just we we have divided hearts at times and god is saying listen i don't need you to have a divided heart in this season not only do i want you to hope in me to be your provider but I, but i want you to have such a devotion for me uh, that you bring me your your best offering I, I want your greatest passions i don't want i don't want to be third fourth fifth sixth on your list of things that you have passion about we it doesn't mean you can't have passion for other things but but for other things but god God has no desire whatsoever for me to, to have him as my third ranking passion. He don't, he don't want me to have sports as my passion. He don't, he don't want me to have my children as a passion that I have greater than him. He don't want me to have my wife uh, as a passion over him. He wants me to have him as my very first passion. And so I think that's the second thing that God's calling us out on as a church is, is that we would, we would actually bring the true worship to him that he desires. So those two things that I've mentioned so far are very corrective. They're, they were corrective to me. Uh, I'm, I'm still in the mode where I'm really trying to focus in on trusting God for my, to be my provider. 
and I'm checking my heart often to make sure that the number one passion of my heart is, is the pursuit of Jesus Christ. Now, the third thing I want to talk to you about is, is about a series that we did at the very beginning of the year out of Ephesians where God began to teach us how to how to wear the armor of God. And I knew why he wanted to teach us that. I knew that that we were going to have to go to war uh, and, and for kingdom things. I knew that, uh, that, that I'm going to have to go to war for my children and for our church and for uh, against addictions, against uh, culture, sometimes even against political things. Uh, the, the answer to our question is always Jesus. And the, and the victory in the times of all of our battles is always him. And so I think he's trying to teach the church how to battle, how to war for our kids and how to war for our marriages and how to war against drug addiction, against all these things the enemy's trying to bring uh, on, on the church in this season. And so no, number three, is, is have we armored up? Uh, are, are we now battling in heavenly realms? Have we learned how to battle in heavenly realms? Now, what, what do I mean by that? Well, there, uh, according to Scripture, there are, there are three heavens. Uh, let me explain them to you like this. The first heaven is, is what we see. It's the things around us. When the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis, he's talking about the stuff you can see. And then in Revelation, there's this, there's this conversation about a third heaven, which means the area where we will spend eternal life. So uh, what God is really speaking to the church and trying to get them to understand when when he's teaching about the, the armor of God in Ephesians 6 is he's trying to remind them about a battle that's going to have to take place in that second heaven. It's to, it's to place the space, the spiritual space between the thing that we see and the place where we're going to spend eternally. Uh, there's There's this war that goes on day in and day out, night and day, 24-7, for the, for the soul of America, but for the soul of the church uh, as well. It goes on for the soul of your family. The enemy is, is, is battling. The Bible says our, our battle, in fact, Ephesians says this, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Well, uh, oftentimes those principalities, they take up the space in the second heavens. It doesn't mean that there's there's this place outside the earth that, that that space that second heaven warfare could be uh, right here in a first heaven uh, existence uh, but it's a, but it's a second heaven battle I don't want to be confusing with that but I'm just saying you, you'll never win first heaven issues the battle over first heaven issues if you try to fight against flesh in, in the first heaven Victories for for first heaven problems are won in a second heaven battle, and so God is trying to teach us to 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 war in the heavenly realm. And the way we do that is we put on the armor of God. We 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 put on the helmet of salvation. We take up the shield of faith. We take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and we and we go to war against our real enemy. Our enemy is not each other. Our, our enemy, if if you got a problem with in relationship with with your husband, your 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 husband's not your problem. He, he may look like he is your problem, but your real enemy is is the enemy. And and the only way uh, that your husband will walk in victory is when a second heaven defeat of the enemy happens over on his behalf. If if our problem is is drug addiction, you can't just tell people don't do drugs. You know you know you got to go to war in a second heaven area. To have a first heaven victory and so that's what that was about god is teaching his church in this season how to battle and teaching us how to how to go to war in in in, in the heavenlies for the things that he wants to, to to transform in the first heavens okay and the final thing it's a series i just finished uh this like few three weeks ago is is he's trying to not only teach us how to war in the heavenlies but he's trying to teach us how to be kingdom focused in other words it's, it's not just about me and mine. It's about us and ours. God God wants the kingdom of God. He wants us pursuing things of the kingdom. In fact, Matthew 6, 33 says, that, Seek you first the kingdom of God. Learning to gain a new mindset. He's trying to teach us to, to, to find our value in Him. Uh, we, we, we just got through with a whole series in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 that, that we had to learn our identity is in Christ. That's that, that verse of scripture starts with if my people 
goes on to say a lot of things you've heard before who are called by my name da 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 but the, 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 the point I, I was focused on with our people to begin with was he, he, he actually starts a scripture with if my people in other words what we do matters he's, he's actually in, in some way depending on us to be obedient uh, uh, as we war in second heaven areas to be faithful kingdom liver, livers we, we need to be people who are about the kingdom of God we need to be people who are about the presence of God. We need to be a people who are pursuing intimacy with God. That's what kingdom life looks like. When you're doing that, you don't have a selfish mentality. But I'm telling you something. God has called us to some deep, deep things, and he's, He has a high expectation for us as we begin to understand our identity and that we are we were we were born in Christ. We we we've been reborn in Christ. We we have we have a call on us in Christ. Uh, he he has a plan for us. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29 that he has a plan and a purpose for my life. And, and, and one of the quotes that I read uh, as I was as we were focusing on kingdom things is that that the fate of nations actually rests in the hands uh, of the righteous. God, when He says, "If my people are called by my name, if they'll humble themselves and pray, I'm going I'm going to hear from heaven. I'm going to heal your land." He's saying, listen, I'm just waiting on you. I, I, I've made provisions uh, for you to, to be heard. I, I've made provision in heaven uh, by, by the cross, through the cross, for you to have a voice with me. I, now I need you to use that voice. And as you use that voice, I'm going to respond to that voice. The, there's another place in Scripture that says, we have not because we ask not. And, and God is basically asking the church to ask. He's saying, listen, put yourself in right, right play. Get yourself in a right identity. Uh, I don't want your identity to be what you do for a living, how much money you have or don't have. I, I don't want it to be who you're married to or what kind of house you live in. I need your identity to be in me. And as you gain your identity in me, I want you to be who I've called you to be and do the thing I've called you to do. And I'll respond to that and bring healing to your land. The fate of America literally rests in the hands of the righteous. How do I know that? Because uh, in, in Scripture, when, when God came to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, he, he said, I'm going to destroy it because of, of the unrighteousness there. And, and there was a conversation between Abraham and, and God where Abraham actually asked God, if you find 50 righteous people in Sodom, will you, will you not destroy it? And he said, I, I won't. How about 45? How about 40? How about 30? How about 5? He finally talked God down. It almost like there was this there was this conversation. He said, "If you find five, if I find right, five righteous people in, in that nation, will you not destroy it?" And God said, "If I find five righteous people in that nation, I won't destroy it." What does that say? It means that God's saying, "Listen, I'm not, I, I'm not, I didn't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because it was evil. I, I, I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because it lacked righteousness." So what does that mean? It means that we, the righteous people of God, not because we are, but because we've been named among the righteous, we actually, we actually carry this banner for our whole nation. And, and the fate of America rests in the hands of, of, of the body of Christ. We, we really can make a difference, and God is letting us know that we can. So quick review. He, he, he called us out of trust in wrong things, uh, wrong provisions. He, he called us into a place of right worship. Why? So that he could teach us how to war in the heavenlies. Why? Because the fourth thing that he's taught us is that if we keep kingdom focus and we have a right identity, we, we have this authority that has been given to us in Christ to walk in, in those battles in heavenly realms and see our entire country transformed simply because we're living righteously and, and, battling, and battling for the kingdom. That's what God's called us to. We're only halfway through our year. There's a lot more stuff that God's pouring out in the church. I know it's happening here. I know it's happening in other churches. I have friends in ministry where God's doing amazing things in their church, stuff they've never seen before. Please get in here and, and get a, be a part of it. I know that you, you're, a lot of you guys have listened week after week after week to this, this online stuff, but it's, it's not the same as being together in the body. We, we need you here. So get back in here. And, 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 and get the second half of what God's getting ready to teach us this next year. You're going to need it. The church is going to need it. Uh, you, your, your family needs it. Uh, and we need you. So get back in here as quick as you can. And let's see what God's going to do with the rest of this year. Because we just flat can't sit this one out. God's, God is calling us out 
of our comfort zones. He's calling us out of our apathy. He's calling us out of our uh, anemic state. And he has poured himself out in this season. So come in here. Uh, get back in your church. Get back in our church. Get back in the body of Christ. And watch what God does in you and through you in these last days. Uh, thank you again for, for tuning in with us today. We love you. We, we thank you. And we'll see you next time. Have a blessed week in the Lord. Amen.